Hello, everybody. Welcome to Philosophy 110, Critical Thinking. I'm Dr. Lee Kirkhove. I teach in the philosophy department. I've been teaching this class at Cal State San Marcos for a really long time, uh, although not necessarily under such unusual conditions as we have this semester, but nevertheless, I think it's going to be fine. Uh, this presentation is intended to introduce you to the class. Essentially, what I'm going to be doing is going over the details of the syllabus, and then I'll talk a little bit at the end about the nature of critical thinking and the kind of thing that we're going to be doing in this class. So this is more or less an orientation to the subject, and it's part of the introductory module that also includes a separate presentation on our basic discussion of what is an argument, which will be one of the fundamental concepts we use in critical thinking. Uh, critical thinking is based on logic, and logic is a science of argument analysis. So the concept of an argument is really very fundamental to essentially everything we'll be doing this semester. So like I said, we're going to move on. First of all, talk about the syllabus, and then I'll talk a little bit about critical thinking. There is in this module a questions and comment forum where you can post your questions and if you have any questions about this presentation or about the syllabus or the class or anything like that post your questions there and I will get to them as soon as I possibly can so we're not going to meet on campus because no one's going to be on campus but this is me in case you run into me down the road in subsequent semesters I don't look like this anymore this was pre-COVID, and I needed a haircut when COVID set in, so now I look more or less like Jack Sparrow from Pirates of the Caribbean. However, when I clean up, this is how I look, and if you do run into me down the road, make sure you say hello. Before we get into the nature of critical thinking, I want to walk you through the syllabus and the course policies, talk about the course description, and what you can expect in this online course. This is a generalized syllabus. More specific information about specific due dates and specific assignment descriptions can be found in Cougar courses where you find the actual specific syllabus for your class. However, all of my classes have the same generic syllabus with the same basic policies. So let's walk our way through those. And then when we get done with that, we could talk a little bit about the nature of critical thinking and what we're going to be exploring in this course. So what are we going to be doing in this class? Well, in the course description, the class is described in the following way. And it says, the purpose of this course is to provide students the conceptual tools and techniques required to develop their abilities as critical thinkers. The central presupposition of this course is that critical thinking is a skill that anyone can develop in a systematic way through effort and practice. Motivating this effort and practice is the idea that full participation in a democratic society requires citizens willing and able to evaluate, critique, and effectively create persuasive arguments. So you have two basic ideas here. What critical thinking is? Well, it's a set of skills. And in the course of this semester, we're going to be learning these skills. And the other thing you have here is why you should learn these skills. And that is, at least in part, because being a, an effective citizen means being a full rational participant in public debate. That last point was made much more eloquently by Thomas Jefferson when he wrote that in a Republican nation whose citizens are to be led by reason and persuasion and not by force, the art of reasoning becomes of the first importance. What he's saying here is, in a Republican nation, he means, of course, a, in a democracy, the citizens have to be convinced, not by means of hitting them on the head, but rather by making arguments. And if we are to be effective citizens, we have to be able to evaluate these arguments and see which ones should persuade us and which ones we should reject. And when we are able to do that, we are critical thinkers. So I just want to give you a little bit of terminology here. As you certainly know, our class is online and it is also asynchronous. This is a very specific thing. A synchronous class has a specific time that it meets. 
So a synchronous online class would be online, but it would meet at a specific time. For example, like 11 to 12.20 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. That means if it's synchronous, you would have to log in at 11 o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and the class would be active and live at those moments. Our class is asynchronous. That means there are no times when the class meets. It's available to you 24 hours a day. You log in whenever you like and work on your own schedule. All the lectures are going to be recorded as MP4 movies, and so there's no particular set time you need to log in. We do have due dates. There will be deadlines. There will be some assignments that have to be turned in at a specific time. But all of the other activities of the course, such as your reading a, the course materials, listening to the lectures, doing the exercises, taking quizzes, all of that stuff can take place on your schedule. It is asynchronous. That means there is no set time. Student learning outcomes or objectives detail what you should be able to do or to do better by the time you have successfully completed the class. Uh, here's a list of the things you should be able to do or do better by the time we are done. You should be able to recognize bias, both in your own arguments and in those of other people. And we will have a unit on cognitive and perceptual and memory biases to help us be able to do that. You should be able to apply the principles of deductive and inductive reasoning. That's going to be the major focus of the first portion of the semester. You should be able to identify logical fallacies. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on that as well. We're going to learn a little bit about translating arguments into symbolic form, but relatively little, just as much as we need to understand some basic concepts. Uh, we will learn major concepts of argument evaluation, and we'll learn what the ideas of validity and invalidity mean, soundness and unsoundness, and other terms like strength and weakness and such, which uh, sounds like a lot, but these are really pretty basic uh, concepts, especially when they're learned step by step as we are going to do them in this class. Um, and finally, we'll develop our skills as persuasive and logical writers with a short argumentative essay. Uh, and I'll have a, uh, an assignment description available for that uh, posted relatively soon. There is no separate textbook that you have to buy for the class. All of the readings and exercises that you'll find are from a book that I wrote with Jim Martin, who also used to teach at Cal State San Marcos before he retired, uh, called Critical Thinking. So uh, I will provide all of the readings and handouts and things like that. There's nothing that you need to buy. All right, so let's talk about the really important stuff. How do I get a grade in this class? What do I have to do? Let's take a look at the course requirements. Uh, there are some assignments. There will be two exams, basically a midterm and a final, each of which is worth 100 points potentially. So that's 200 points possible right there. The midterm covers material from the first half of the semester, and the final exam, which will take place at the end, of course, covers material from the second portion of the semester. Participation will be a key component of the class. During each module, there will be a discussion forum, and you will be asked to participate by responding to a question and responding to uh, the posts of your fellow students. There will be more information provided within the uh, participation forums about that. There will be one short paper, three to five pages, in which you will construct an argument on a topic that I will give to you, and there will be an assignment description that will be posted that paper is worth a potential 100 points. And then throughout the semester, we have five quizzes, each of which is worth 25 points. And if so, if you add up all the maximum point totals here, uh, it equals 500 points possible. When these assignments take place and when each thing is due, uh, can be found within the schedule uh, that you will be talking about just uh, in a little bit here. So the grade scale is based on a 10% scale with a 500 point maximum point total. So every 50 points is a grade level. And so once we have a grade level established, that 50 points is divided into three segments, which indicates the minus 
regular and plus version of a grade, like B minus B or B plus. All of those are based on your point totals after all of the assignments are turned in. So here is the full scale as you can see. To earn a A in the class, you need 475 or more points. At this point, the major point I want to make is that to pass the class and satisfy the critical thinking requirement for graduation, you have to earn a C or better. That is 360 points or more. Please note, a C minus is not a C. C minus or lower does not satisfy the requirement for graduation. So please keep that in mind as the semester proceeds and you're calculating your potential grade and how well you have to do on future assignments. Your ultimate goal, of course, is to do as well as you possibly can. But of course, satisfying the requirement is a preliminary goal to doing that. And that requires at least earning a C. So to sum up, uh, we have two, two exams, a midterm and a final. The final is not comprehensive. It just covers the material from the second half of the semester. Each exam is worth 100 points, and the exams will be open note, open book. You can use all of the resources that are available, including the PowerPoints and the lectures uh, that you have been studying along the way. Um, the way I set up the exams is you'll have more than one attempt. So you can try to take the exam, and if you're happy with your score, that's fine. If you want to try to do better, you can. And the way the exams are set up is that only your highest exam will count. So that's all to your benefit. Throughout the semester, we'll have some quizzes. Um, these are usually tied to the topic of the, of the particular module we're working our way through to, just to see how you're doing. Are you getting the basic ideas? These are low stakes, but they're important because they can tell you uh, whether or not you're getting the basic ideas or if you need to do some remedial work. We'll have a short paper and I'll have the topic for that posted relatively soon. This is a three to five page uh, argumentative essay and you'll know of course by the time you get this assignment a little bit more about the nature of argumentation so that will help you to improve your your paper and to construct it well. And then we have participation and I'll be talking about participation in the subsequent slides. So uh, let's get right on to that. So in each module of the class, and there are seven main modules after the introductory module, there will be a discussion forum where you are required to make some posts, to post your own ideas and to reply to another student's posts in order to receive credit for participation, which would be the uh, analogous to the kind of participation we would do in a normal face-to-face -face class. And so I've tried to outline here in this slide and the subsequent slide what to do and what counts as participation. So uh, I don't have a, a, a set word count, but it's a substantive post of between somewhere between 100 and 200 words where you answer the question posed in the prompt or reply to another student and discuss the ideas that that student has posted. Okay, so uh, this will be a regular feature. Each module will have a prompt that you will be asked to follow. And uh, I will be also interacting with students as they're making their prompts as well. This is uh, not the same as asking a question in the questions forum. Those are different and those don't count towards participation. Uh, this is responding to the specific question prompt uh, or discussion forum in each of these separate modules. So the basic idea is to strive to say something substantive, something reflective, something that you've thought about. Uh, and so therefore participation involves making a post that is substantive and thoughtful, that is a constructive comment that responds to another student's prompt uh, and furthers the conversation. What doesn't count as participation would be an extremely brief note such as saying good point or I agree or just you know a very simple short response. Those are not restricted. You can certainly do those, but obviously there, there's not enough substance there for a brief comment like that to count as participation. And of course, 
we are in a public forum where certain standards of decorum and a certain elevated form of expression is expected. So in the forums, please avoid using foul language or inappropriate language. Please avoid any personal attacks with anyone you may happen to disagree with. And please refrain from any confrontational discourse or you might be restricted from further participation in the discussion forums, which of course would have a very negative effect on your final grade. What we're striving to create here is an exchange of an ideas, an exchange of ideas that is open and where everybody is free to have their own point of view and to express that point of view as well. So that's about it for the syllabus. Uh, I'd like to conclude this brief presentation with a short description of what we're going to be doing in this class. Uh, it's a critical thinking class. Some of you may have studied critical thinking before, but probably the vast majority of you have not. And this is also a philosophy class, and I know that hardly anybody prior to college has taken a philosophy class. So you may want to know what to expect and what we're going to be doing in this class. So I'm going to discuss a little bit with you the nature of critical thinking in kind of a general sense, and that will conclude our introduction. And then we can move on to our first major topic, which will be the question about what is an argument, and that will be in the subsequent presentation. To begin with, let's look at the name of this class. It's called critical thinking. Now in everyday language, the term critical has negative connotations. When someone is critical of us, that typically means they're pointing out our flaws or our shortcomings or some way in which we have fallen short. So critical means pointing out flaws in that sense. This is how the word is typically used when we say that for example, my friends are being critical of me. That means that they're pointing out my shortcomings. But in the context of critical thinking, the term critical means something positive. It implies the ability to discriminate, the ability to weigh argumentation and to make sound judgments. And an analogy I often make is to the task of a film critic or a food critic or let's say an art critic for example the job of an art critic or a food critic is not to point out flaws or at least it's not just to point out flaws in a work of art or in a work of food it's to evaluate that work of art or that dish or that film and to say here are its merits here are its flaws and to weigh the quality of that work of art or that dish or whatever. So a, a art critic or a food critic, if they're a good critic, can not only determine which works are good and which works are bad, but perhaps even more importantly, they can say why. They can say why because they have standards of evaluation. They don't simply say every film is great or every film is terrible. Uh, that would probably be the worst film critic in history and no one would pay attention to that person rather we want someone to be able to say you should see this film here's why you should not see this film here's why they have standards of evaluation that we can appreciate and use to make up our own minds so that's what we want to do but the thing that we are going to be critical of is not film or art or food but arguments which arguments are good ones, which ones should we accept if we're reasonable and open-minded, and which ones are bad arguments, which ones should we reject. It's not a matter of feeling, it's a matter of having standards of evaluation if we want to be critical thinkers. And we should want to be critical thinkers because being an uncritical thinker is really not a very good thing to be. Being uncritical means you have no standards of evaluation. If you have no standards of evaluation, how do you form your thoughts? How do you know what to accept? How do you know when an argument is a good one or a bad one? And the answer is you don't. Uh, you're acting in a kind of an arbitrary, unprincipled way in your thinking. And those kinds of people tend to be described by terms such as gullible, uh, stubborn, cynical, but they're not described as 
critical. They're not described as reasonable people. It's not a good thing to be uncritical. Uncritical means you have no standards, and our job is to think, but to think with standards that allow us to evaluate arguments to determine which are good and which are bad. Critical thinking is not just one thing. It's a set of cognitive skills. A lot of these cognitive skills involve learning certain principles of logic and applying them to everyday situations and everyday arguments. That's the logical reasoning component. But you can't just be logical. If you don't have any knowledge, then you could be as logical as you want, but you're still not going to reach sound conclusions because you don't have a database that you can use to ground your logical reasoning. So critical thinking involves reasoning using principles, having a knowledge base, but it also involves insight into people's psychological character and the motives that people have for making a, an argument, uh, the biases that people might have. Uh, whether these biases are conscious or unconscious, they are almost always present, and they're present in ourselves as well, as we'll see when we talk about uh, perceptual biases and cognitive biases, and we also have to be aware of those so they don't influence our thinking in a negative way. So being able to apply all of these skills uh, effectively is the task of becoming a critical thinker, and it's a multifaceted set of tasks that we need to acquire. And so I'd like to conclude with some good news and some better news. The good news is that you already have skills of critical thinking. That's how you got into Cal State San Marcos, and that's what you've acquired through your first 12 or so years of learning. So our job is not to start from scratch. Our job is to take what you already have and make it better. That's the good news. The better news is that this is something that everyone can do because critical thinking is a skill. And I really want to emphasize that point. Being able to think critically is not a gift. It's not something that people are born with. Some people are born with certain gifts. There are people who are spectacularly talented with regard to music. There are people who are spectacularly talented with regard to learning. We see stories sometimes in the news about 13-year-olds going to medical school. Um, and that's all great. They're gifted. But critical thinking doesn't require that. Critical thinking is a skill, and it's like any other skill. You're not born knowing how to do it. You're not born knowing how to speak any particular language. You're not born with any particular athletic ability uh, or any other kind of musical ability or skill. You acquire them through practice, and that's the point. The more you practice, the more you do the exercises in this class, the more you attempt to understand the lectures and apply them to the, to the exercises that we're learning, the more steps you will therefore take towards acquiring the skills of being a critical thinker. And if you do that diligently, by the end of the semester, you should be able to do all those things that are listed uh, under the course objectives that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, you'll be able to do them to a much greater extent that you can do them already. So that's the, the even better news. So there's good news and then there's better news. So uh, that's all I really wanted to say about critical thinking at the outset. The nuts and bolts uh, will be acquired starting with the next presentation, which I'll talk about in the final slide of this discussion. So the second major topic of this introductory module is a very fundamental topic. It's the topic, what is an argument? As I mentioned, a lot of critical thinking is the application of logic. Well, logic is the science of argumentation. It gives us the conceptual tools we need to evaluate arguments and discriminate or judge which ones are good and which ones are bad. So in the presentation on what is an argument, we're going to first learn the component parts of an argument, premises and conclusions. We're going to learn how to identify the premises of an argument and the conclusion of an argument effectively, um, and then once we've got that topic mastered, we can move on to the subsequent uh, 
skills of argument classification and evaluation that we'll be taking on in the subsequent modules. So we go in baby steps and we acquire the skills that we need as a critical thinker in stages. So step one, master the basic concepts of what constitutes an argument and that will be the next presentation in this module. So I will see you there. Thanks for your time.